I have some slides I've prepared here, and I'd like to just kind of walk through some of these and um, share some things with you, but I'd like to keep it informal. So if you have questions, just uh, jump in. Um, I think you have to either see my slides or my face, and um, my slides are a little more interesting, so I'm going to share the slides with you, but um, if we get talking quite a lot, I'll just switch back to the, the video camera. Um, so let's see. Um, to start with, I wanted to just um, be clear about a couple of things. One is that you know there's a lot of interest in Google Drive right now, and uh, this talk is about something that predates Google Drive. Google Cloud Storage is a high capacity, high performance uh, storage capability in the cloud that Google's actually had for um, about two years now. So it's, um, it's something that's pretty well established and has been out there for a while. But um, because of the interest in Google Drive, I think a lot of people have been getting more interested in this whole space. And um, so I just wanted to be clear that I'm not actually focusing today on Google Drive, but I do have some slides coming up where I will kind of um, compare and contrast the two um, technologies a little bit and explain maybe a little bit for why you might prefer to use one for certain tasks and another for, for some other types of applications. Um, the, the slides that you see here in the lower left corner, there's a little link you can click on if you want to watch them yourself. Uh, or take a copy of them after this talk. And um, this submit questions here link is somewhere where you can um, enter your own questions um, for which we can we can talk about later. So feel free to go there. Um, I like to usually start this talk with a little bit of Google trivia. It's a it's a little bit um, the back the back and forth is a little bit tricky with this um, with the Hangouts right now. So I probably won't do a lot of quizzing you guys, and I'll just share some answers in stream here. But basically, I like to ask about some things like how much video you think is uploaded to YouTube every minute. Actually, you can throw out an answer if you, if you want to take a guess. This is in time, like in terms of how many minutes of video or hours of video you think is getting uploaded every minute. Any guesses? So it's 60 hours of new video every minute. Um, how large do you think Google's caffeine search engine is? Search index, rather. Um, most people think it's probably terabytes or something, but it's actually petabytes. It's 100 petabytes, which is 100 million gigabytes large. Um, how many active Gmail users do you think Google serves currently? Any guesses? So the answer is the 350 million active users, and this is probably a little bit dated. The number is undoubtedly larger than that, but that's the last official number I tracked down. And how long do you think it takes to respond to a search query? This one people kind of have an intuitive sense for. It's a pretty small number. It's a fraction of a second. So on average, with all the search traffic that goes on at Google's main site, um, on average we return search queries within about a quarter of a second. So the point of all those questions really is to kind of reinforce something that I think everybody knows, which is we, we're constantly managing huge volumes of data, storing, retrieving, and accessing data at sub-second speeds for hundreds of millions of users all the time. And in order to do that, we had to basically invent our own technology kind of world-leading technology in this space in order to deal with all this, um, to store all this data and retrieve it all fast. And that's kind of the motivation for a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. Just a quick detour on who I am. I work for the Seattle Google, in the Seattle Google office on the developer relations team. Developer relations simply means that we're kind of outreach um, experts. We, we, our job is to make sure that um, outside developers have access to the best technology and understand how to use it and can get the most out of it. So that's what I specialize in, and I focus specifically on cloud computing. Um, and you can click on my G Plus profile there if you want to connect to me and so on. Um, so let's switch gears and talk about cloud storage. The significance of this picture, by the way, anybody know what it is? Any? Um, Anybody who's been to the Stanford University campus recently? So there's an answer. So, 
What was that? There's a, there's a guess in the chat window there. What's the guess? First server. The first server, that's right. So this is Google's very first storage server. Um, so it was you know, kind of like a whimsically designed rack, rack mounted server that you know, s stores probably about as much disk space as, as like a modern uh, home computer, maybe a little bit more, but like a ridiculously small amount of disk space for our time. But this was a state of the art rack for the early days of Google and it's obviously built with the, the cute googly Lego blocks and stuff like that. But we've come a long way since then. Um, and trying to manage all that data I talked about earlier and do it in a way that's fast and scalable and secure and reliable, it's not a hard, it's not an easy problem to solve. There's a lot of very um, formidable engineering work that's been done over the years to make that possible. So as I said, we face some of the world's most demanding storage challenges like indexing the entire web, um, et cetera. There's a cute little um, info blurb here. We have to store um, as much video on YouTube per month or more than the three major US networks have broadcast in the last 60 years. So there's a lot of bits being stored here. And Google has met those challenges by inventing internal solutions that have all the attributes you would need if you wanted a system like this. It's reliable and consistent. Uh, it's replicated and highly available. We have planet-wide scalability. It's all done with a, a very strong emphasis on security to make sure that you know people can't see your data and you can't see other people's data. Uh, high, uh, high performance, of course, and everything's distributed and geo-redundant. And the idea behind Google Cloud Storage is really to make that available to you. So um, we've built this storage network and all of this technology in order to do to make our job effective and efficient and all that good stuff. Um, but we want that technology to be something that you guys can take advantage of for, for uh, whatever you want to do with it. And so um, we've created this product called Google Cloud Storage, which has a number of attributes you see here. It lets you store any amount of data up to five terabytes per object. Um, the data gets stored in the cloud, so it's, it's basically a way of transferring your data up to the network and then gets stored in Google's infrastructure. And then, of course, you can retrieve it whenever you want. Um, data can be replicated across the U.S. or European data centers. And you can actually, it's not only replicated there, it can be homed in one of those two regions as well. So you can dictate that you want your data in, to be stored in the U.S. or to be stored in, in Europe and thereby make it more um, uh, faster and easier to access in one of those two regions. We offer strong read after write data consistency. So what that means is that after you uh, get a 200 OK, let's say you're uploading some data and storing it in an object, after you get confirmation from Google that you've actually received your information and stored it on disk, um, at that instant, you're guaranteed that that data is going to be available and that you can come and retrieve it. And that might seem kind of obvious, like, of course, it's, it's available. You, you just told me it was. But um, with a lot of modern cloud-based storage systems, that guarantee is not um, provided. What, what um, many other providers actually give you is something called eventual consistency. And that's because ensuring that all the data gets written and stored safely in all the right places, um, it's not always possible to guarantee that if you turn around and do a read immediately after that write, that you'll actually see the updated data. So some other storage, cloud storage providers will um, actually have a period of time when you might not see the actual changes you just wrote. And we put a lot of effort, engineering effort, into ensuring that that's not the case, that as soon as we finish writing your data, that you can turn around and read it immediately from anywhere in the world. So that's kind of a distinguishing uh, feature. Um, we support streaming uploads and resumable transfers. So if you're uploading large amounts of data, you can do it in a streaming basis without having to tell us every, uh, having to spool up every byte of the transfer ahead of time. Resumable transfers means uh, that you know you might have a very large object you're transferring. Maybe it's uh, five terabytes. 
and after many, many, many hours, maybe uh, you're at 4.8 of the 5, you're, you're almost done, and then let's imagine something goes wrong with your internet connection. Resumable transfers is a protocol that you can use to uh, recover from that situation and pick up where you left off and just transfer the last bits rather than starting from scratch. Um, we have high performance that just works. That's really just a way of saying that we ensure that the data gets to you with um, immaculate response time, excellent um, response time, without you having to, to prearrange that condition. So some, some providers have uh, what's called content uh, delivery networks or caching networks. And what Google does is we leverage the fact that we have a worldwide uh, delivery network for our other services, and we make use of that network to ensure that we get the objects to you with the best possible speed and response time. So probably going a little too slow here, so let me spice it up, or let me speed it up a little bit. So we have a, a service level agreement that you can read more about if you're interested in the, the terms and conditions. Um, we support what's called a bucket object paradigm, and if you're familiar with some other providers like Amazon S3, you probably know about that. But it's basically the idea that all of your storage is organized into a two-level hierarchy. You create a set of buckets, which come from a common namespace, and then within each bucket, you can create a collection of objects, and those are completely managed. The namespace for those objects is completely managed by you. You're free to define them however you want, and they can... Um, you have a complete namespace within each bucket. Um, and those two hierarchy levels enable you to create the entire variety of storage objects that you would want to operate on. All of this delivered through um, Google's worldwide network. By the way, this blue line high performance that just works, that's a hyperlink to uh, a blog article that talks a little bit more about our performance. So I'd recommend you to click on that and take a look if you're interested in digging a little bit more deeply there. Any questions so far? Okay. So um, and just a reminder to everyone that the link um, that's on the footer there in, in Mark's slides, um, which is meant to be easy to type, you can um, bring up the slides yourself and follow along if you want. Yep. Thanks, Amy. So um, the next slide talks about it is really amplifying what I said about the fact that we have Google. Google has data centers all over the world, and we take advantage of that uh, infrastructure in order to provide the best, uh, fastest response times. And um, just as kind of a hidden bonus, there, you can click on this image, and it will take you to the site where I got that, um, that map. And it's kind of a cool site. If you've never seen this, it's called Greg's Cable Map. It's actually like an interactive, up-to-date um, map of all the world's um, long-haul communication links, including the key undersea cable links. And you can go to a particular region. It's kind of a mashup with Google Maps. So you can go to your region, like I'm in Seattle right now, and I can go there and um, went a little too broad there. But I can go to whatever region I'm interested in, and I can actually examine the different um, undersea cables going into my region. It's kind of a cool, cool site that I just learned about recently. Um, so, so a little bit about how you, uh, what you can do with Google Cloud Storage. Um, but once you actually upload your data, you might be interested in understanding how to control access to it. Um, I mentioned that we put a high priority on security. And the way that we control access to cloud resources is through something called access control lists. So um, this is an industry standard kind of um, way of, of managing access. Uh, you define project teams associated with your storage resources. So you can create groups of people, or you can create individual uh, list individual people who are allowed to access your, your objects and your buckets. And you can actually assign a particular set of permissions to those um, users or groups. Like you can specify who can read or you know, whether certain people can read or write or um, have full control over your objects. Um, the group capability is really powerful because if you have a large number of people you want to share data with, um, instead of having to continually update the ACLs on a given object 
to change to reflect um, changing membership of that group, you can just assign um, a Google group to that ACL, and then you can go and administer the Google group independently. So it adds kind of a level of indirection between your object and the set of people who are accessing your data. Um, in addition to these project team oriented um, specifications, you can assign uh, one of these access control lists directly to a bucket or to an object. And um, there's a bunch of predefined uh, access control settings like public uh, project read, project write, public read, um, things like that. So for, for the most standard kinds of configurations, we've made it easy for you to specify those, those permissions mnemonically. Um, I didn't talk about authorization, but we use an industry standard protocol called OAuth2. And so once you've logged yourself in, um, the way you get, the way Google decides whether you have access to certain types of capabilities or APIs is through something called OAuth2. And I won't go into too much detail there, but it's, it's basically a way of delegating permission so that um, it's kind of, I kind of think of it at like, as like uh, a valet key. If you, if you drop your car off at a valet and you want to give limited permission to the person who takes your car, you can give them a valet key and it only lets them start the car but not open the glove box, for example. OAuth2 is a similar kind of a system. It, it gives somebody the ability to tell an application, I want to give you access to my Google, Google Cloud storage resources. But I don't necessarily want to give you my password and my login name and give you complete access to everything about my Google account. And so um, that's kind of what OAuth is in a nutshell, but we can explore in more detail if anybody has questions about OAuth. But the combination of OAuth and the ACLs and the project membership management, all of that stuff together gives you very powerful and very flexible access control. So, I've been blabbing about Google Storage for a little while now. And oh, and, uh, Mark, before you move on from uh -huh. um, that topic, we have a question in the chat. Um, are there any videos around describing OAuth 2 that you could give a link to for later? Um, I'm trying to turn off my screen sharing <laughs> so I can talk for a second on camera. Oh, I think I did. Okay. Are you seeing me? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, so there's a lot of good written material on OAuth 2, but um, I will say from experience, it tends to be one of the trickier protocols to get right. And um, partly that's because there's a lot of different modes available. Like if you're writing a web app, you use one type of mode. If you're writing like an embedded mobile Android app, you'd use a different mode. And all of the different modes have their own sort of eccentricities. So it is it can be a little bit of a hard pill to swallow, but um, it's it's worth it because once you get the hang of it, um, it's it's not so bad. And it's sort of the key to using every API at Google. Almost every I won't say every, but most APIs at Google. So that's the long answer. The the short answer is I don't know of a great video introduction to OAuth, but um, I can I can look around and try to get something to you offline. Amy, can you note the um, email address? Is that possible of the questioner? Yeah. yeah um, if you um, if you would want to, to email me. Um, yeah, or me directly. The very first slide there has my email, or I'm, I think it might be the about me slide, maybe the third slide. Get yeah, more resources to you. There are also, I know there are some some code samples um, that show a little of that. I don't have them to hand, so we could look those up as well. Right, that's a good point too. So if you go to code.google.com and you search for the standard Google API client library for the language you're working in, whether it's Python or Ruby or um, Java, whatever language you like, look for the standard Python, or rather the standard Google client library uh, code project. And most of those have uh, example code, including how to do the OAuth authorization dance. Any other questions? OK. I will go back to the 
Alaska. And, okay, so at the beginning I said um, this talk's not really about Drive, it's about Google Cloud Storage. And um, I want to kind of talk a little bit about Drive now because um, it's gotten a lot of press. It's a really cool feature, really cool service. Um, and, but I think there's been some confusion about what's the difference between the product I just described and Google Drive. Why would I want to use one versus the other? So I put this table together to try to summarize the differences. Um, it all kind of flows from the very first line. Google Drive is primarily targeted to consumers and cloud storage is primarily designed for developers. So what does that mean exactly? If you know, you're, a, you're a computer user and you want to store your data in the cloud and maybe you want to combine your data from Google Docs with, with files that you're experimenting with locally, um, Google Drive is a great solution for you because that's exactly what it's designed to do. And in addition, it has very nice synchronization capabilities where you, know, you define uh, a local folder and you drop some things in that folder and, and those files that you've dropped get automatically synchronized into the cloud so that um, a few minutes later when you go to somebody else's computer or you pull up your mobile device or your tablet, you automatically see those same files everywhere you go. So, Really nice, but the focus is on end users being making it um, easy and powerful for them to manage their own individual data. Uh, Google Cloud Storage, on the other hand, the target's really developers, so it's focusing on people who are building applications for other people, for end users. Um, and what that means is it's more of an, ha has more of a programmer's focus to it and more of an API focus to it. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean that Google Drive doesn't have an API or doesn't have a programmer, programmable context to it. It does, and there are a bunch of partners that were announced along with Google Drive who are taking advantage of that API. So they both are usable by software developers, but um, with Drive, the developers are more of kind of a, a, a background ecosystem is the way I think about it, whereas with Google Cloud Storage, the developers are the core audience. Um, the ownership model for the data is kind of follows that paradigm. So the end user owns their data. When you log in to Google Drive, you're looking at only your personal data. Um, for Google Cloud Storage, the application owns the data. And I have a typo there, obviously. I'm not sure where that W came from. But um, basically, the application is going to manage data on your behalf, or maybe not even on your behalf. Maybe it's pooled data that's shared by everyone in the community. And I'll give you an example coming up of, of the different types of applications I have in mind here. Um, billing and quota. So when you're using Google Drive, you're subject to your quota in terms of how much data you can store. And um, you're going to be billed personally at your credit card, whatever you, credit card you provided uh, with your Google account. Whereas under Google Cloud Storage, again, it, the, everything maps to the application and the application provider. So the application provider develop slash developer is going to have a quota and it's going to have some billing arrangement with Google and that party is going to be responsible for all of the costs associated with the storage it manages. If that application wants to provide storage for end users, which is perfectly reasonable, it's going to have to um, deal with recovering those costs and uh, managing relationships and identities and access control and all that stuff. Um, but that's between the application and its end users. That's Google's relationship sort of ends at the, at the application level. Um, the users being consumers versus developers, we kind of hit that already. Um, oh, sorry, this is user experience. So um, typically, um, because the consumer focus, Drive has a consumer focus, you'll find that the, the end user um, the end user tooling is, is a little bit more refined, right? So you, you'll see lots of um, desktop drag and drop type capabilities. 
whereas under Google Cloud Storage, it's because it's targeted to developers, it's a little bit more Spartan. Um, you'll see a lot more usage of command line tools and the RESTful uh, HTTP API. There is some drag and drop, like there's a nice web UI available, which I can show you for Google Cloud Storage, but um, there's not as much in the way of, of nice uh, end user oriented client capabilities for all the different operating systems. Um, resource limits, so because Google Drive is more oriented towards individual users, you'll see that the resource limits are a little bit smaller, a little lower, as, per, as would be appropriate for individuals. Because cloud storage is more for building potentially large aggregated applications, it has much larger uh, resource constraints. So whereas you can only do create a 10 gigabyte file with Google Drive, uh, cloud storage users can create, or developers can create uh, five terabyte objects in, in one object. And there are many other resource limits that are kind of similarly uh, oriented. Last point here is that Google Cloud Storage is very well integrated with um, App Engine. And so if you're an application developer who likes the scalability and power of the App Engine platform, um, <coughs> you can combine those two and, and use them together and, and get the best of both services. Um, it's also well integrated with our big data services. So if you're doing something with like the, the recently announced, um, well, uh, just went, went um, public yesterday, BigQuery, which is a very cool um, big data analysis query engine. If you're using that or you're using Google Prediction API or one of our other big data services, um, a lot of those work together with uh, Google Cloud Storage. In fact, um, a lot of them are built on top of Cloud Storage. Oh, and Mark, yeah. Um, yeah. Question? On from that slide, um, the, very recently there's been um, App Engine integration with the Images API also. And um, there's, in addition to the Files API. So that's really neat. You can. Um, essentially use the images API to, to do transforms and scaling and rotation and things like that on your um, Google Cloud storage objects and then serve those up um, similarly to what you can already do in the App Engine with the blog store. So, um, so that's, that's pretty new. And there, there's, uh, in Mark's slides, there's a, a little um, code example that um, probably we, we won't actually um, get to today. But if you take a look at the slides, it shows you a little bit about that. Can, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Yeah. Um, with, um, you said there's App Engine um, integration. What about, um, uh, like for instance, I mentioned the organization I'm with, we just moved to GApp, so all of our user objects um, are are in you know are in G apps. Can we leverage that authentication and organization structure within the uh, cloud product with the cloud APIs? So um, you said that your organization is on Google Apps now. Right. Yeah. We, right. We moved the Google Apps of so, you know Gmail, Docs. You know we're, we we've got all the standard stuff, but with um the, the with uh, the cloud storage. Um, how, is there any integration there? Can we leverage, like you talked about using the uh, OAuth to authentication. Is that something that is considered, you know, we'd use that against a, another corporate directory or can you use the authentication, you know, user IDs and passwords that are already in GApps, if you already have GApps against uh, cloud storage? Right. So, so the fact that you're, first of all, Google Cloud Storage can be used you know, pretty much by anyone who wants to set up an account. Um, but the fact that your organization is on Google Docs mean, or Google Apps rather means that you know your folks already have all have Google accounts, Google identities, and so uh, that would make it very easy for them to to authenticate and work with um, you know use the resources in Google Cloud Storage. There's still, you know, a question as to what you what you want to do with it, you know, how you would use it, what problems you might want to solve with it, but it would certainly be fully available to you to, to use for any any task you need it for. 
I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure if I'm hitting the question or if, if but but you know, no, of, yeah, you, you you should be able to make use of it fully, and um, it's a great great place to store enterprise data, for example, if you wanted to back up your company data or something like that. Well, that's that was uh, that was my that was the question for later, but that was exactly what I was uh, alluding to. Mm -hmm. Yep, that would be possible for sure. Any other questions? Okay, I'll go back to the screen. So let's see. I talked about you know the differences, but. Here's a few different examples of different types of applications you could maybe imagine having and which one each might use. So you can imagine building um, a virtual museum tour, like an art museum or something, which might have tons of imagery, but none of the imagery would necessarily be associated with a particular end user. And so cloud storage is a great solution for that because it's very scalable, very high capacity, very fast. And it gives the application developer the ability to um, you know, just access this massive repository and serve up those images to anyone it wants to. And it can decide to make those free, or it can decide to create groups, access groups of its own to decide who can see what imagery or how much it might cost. All of that's entirely up to the developer. Um, you can also imagine like a document comparison service where you know you might want to take two different versions of documents in the cloud and assume they're let's assume they're in Google Docs and you might want to be able to to merge the two, make comparisons and merge two different versions of documents. Um, Drive would be a good a good option for that because in that case you're trying to make give people the ability to operate on their own data. Um, and assuming this was conceived to be useful for people that already had Google Docs stuff, this would be a great solution because you know it's already it already works with Drive, and that's kind of the main paradigm of Google Drive. Another option would be application, or rather, App Engine developers and data scientists who are wanting to just do massive analysis, like um, you know, human genome sequencing, something like that, um, where they want the, the huge scalability of cloud storage. That would be a good application for cloud storage. And then finally, just people, the average person wanting to store their own data in the cloud, that's sort of natural for Google Drive. So the distinguishing feature you know, comes through there that in one case, it's people managing their own data. In the other case, it's applications managing data on behalf of other people. Hopefully, um, I hit that enough. <laughs> Probably a little too much, but um, next slide shows um, Google Cloud Storage Manager. So this is our web UI, and this is another one of those clickable images. If you if you just click on that hyperlink, it'll open up a new tab and take you to the Cloud Storage Manager. This is a nice graphical interface. You can um, drill down into a bucket. Th those were I kind of glossed over, but I have two buckets here: Mark Foo and Mark Pest bucket. And if I click on one of the buckets, it shows me the, the multiple objects in that bucket. I can click on, a, on an object, and it'll actually open that object for me. I can go back. Let me close that tab. I can go back and do some cute things like uh, share the object publicly. And if I do so, I get a link that I can click on, or I can copy, copy the link address. And so this kind of illustrates an important point, which is, you're not necessarily limited to um, you know, accessing cloud storage through an API. You're not always going to be writing code to read and write um, your resources. You can also generate URLs to access those resources. And the same sorts of access control list capabilities that I mentioned earlier, which dictate who, when, how can people access resources through the API, also dictate how people can access resources through the URL. So you know, I can do something like um, right-click on copy link address from here and go to a new new window, and I get a URL, standard URL. I can enter that, and that just retrieved that object from cloud storage. 
So it's a very nice, very convenient way to serve up content or to upload content if you're writing an application that wants to send data our way and store it in our cloud. Um, you can also create um, new folders and, and upload data. You can drag and drop from your desktop right onto the screen here to, to do an upload. Um, see if I can show that quickly. There's a PDF file which I'm dragging onto the, the main window here. You can see it's uploading it and now it's stored in my uh, Mark II bucket along with the other files that were just there. So that's it on the, the storage manager. Um, there's also a way to access GSU or, uh, Google Cloud Storage through a command line utility we have called GSUtil. Um, for time reasons, I think I'm not going to go down that path. <laughs> um, but I will say that it's a super powerful capability for people that like to use command line tools as well as for scripting purposes. So you can write shell scripts and um, use this tool in a shell script to automate all kinds of interesting things. Um, and it's got some really nice capabilities, as you can see, including um, one of my favorites is the there's a, a parallel download and upload capability, which makes it really easy to transfer huge numbers of objects in parallel and uh, get some really high bandwidth, high throughput um, performance that way. Any questions on um, either of those two tools? OK. Um, the other thing to know about cloud storage is that we're constantly improving it. So I work closely with the team who is, uh, that is responsible for, for uh, engineering this product. And it's an extremely impressive group of people. And we're constantly looking for ways to keep making it better. So we, we, never, we never rest. Um, this is just a list of the last you know, several features that I could think of that we added fairly recently in the last few months. Um, Version-based concurrency control, that's a way to uh, ensure that if you're trying to implement a multiple access concurrency scheme where you want multiple parties to be able to update a file at the same time or an object at the same time, there's ways to um, find out what, which revision a given object is at and when you upload a version to only upload that version if the currently stored version is, uh, you know, if you're operating on version N, you can say I only want to upload this version if the current version is N minus one. You know, basic ways to implement concurrency control. Um, we have things like access logs, which are great for auditing access, keeping track of who's, who's using your storage resources. Um, Short-lived URLs and policy-based uploads are really nice for um, delegating access to your resources. So let's say you want to, let's imagine you have an Android app or an iPhone app and you want to serve the content from cloud storage. You, um, you might not want to make that content, like, like let's imagine it's strategic um, image files or sound data for your game. And it's, a, it's large enough content that you don't want to embed it in your game binary. So a, a typical approach would be to um, deploy your binary without the content and to have it on demand to download the content from cloud storage. It's a nice way to operate. It also gives you the flexibility to change the content on the fly um, without forcing your end users to, to re-download your app. But the problem is you, know, you might consider some of that content to be strategic um, information technology and you might not want to make that publicly available to everyone in the world. And this, um, these signed downloads and uploads give you the ability to kind of associate a policy with your, um, with your objects and give them uh, short-lived URLs, for example, so you, they can have sort of an expiration time associated with them. Um, yep. Kind of on the, those same lines, we've had some um, other security-related questions and access-related questions in the chat um, that okay. people watching the broadcast might be interested in. Um, one question was, are 
objects transferred over SSL when you use um, GSUtil? And the, the answer um, is yes. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. And then um, another one is the storage in um, Go Cloud, and I did not actually understand that question, but you apparently did. <laughs> um, could you elaborate on that, um, Joe or Via? Um, so basically, I guess one of us can kind of elaborate on that. Um, so GovCloud, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. So the GovCloud is a special, um, Joe can correct me if I'm uh, correct here, but um, basically it's a separate set of servers that uh, needs a stricter mandate for government uh, data. So there's certain uh, government agencies that want to put data in the cloud and um, there is, um, right now, there is no such thing for Google Cloud Storage. Um, maybe. Okay. That's not, not currently supported. Does that cover it? Was it Joe that asked that? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, Amy, on your uh, chat window? The, there was the response headers thing, and I think that got answered, VJ. Uh, yeah, the question was was how to control response headers, um, say for cache control. Oh, and okay. um, uh, the the answer on the chat that you might want to elaborate on, Mark, is that you when you upload a file, you can specify the headers. So, so. right. So yeah, GSUtil has a way to. To do that as well, you can use using the REST API. You can um, specify the uh, the header. I think it's a cache control header. And um, the other thing is, if you um, if you make an object public read, then uh, that will sort of uh, by default uh, make it cacheable for us. So there's sort of an implicit way to do it and an explicit way to do it. Any other questions? Sorry, I wasn't seeing the chat window until I just yeah. ended up a little while ago. Art is, looks like everything's covered there. Thank you, Vile, for, for being our uh, answerer, chat window answerer. Um, I'll jump back to some slides, but we're almost done here. Um, so I was talking about the continuous innovation, and I just wanted to emphasize that you know there's a lot of stuff going on, and um, I wanted to end this slide just by saying that if you see some value in this uh, service, if it's something that you um, would like to know more about or you have some ideas about features we can add, please let me know. My email address again is in the about me part of the talk, so um, we're always really interested in hearing what what new ideas you guys might come up with for uh, improving the service. Um, a couple of slides uh, giving a little bit more depth, and I'm going to kind of gloss over these because we're, we're pretty short on time here, but um, Google App Engine integration, this slide is um, illustrating how easy it is to read and write uh, cloud storage files or objects from App Engine. And so one of the things we talked about earlier was OAuth 2 and, and how to learn how to use it and all that stuff. And the great thing about this example is it doesn't, it, it does everything it needs to do in order to authorize the application, but you don't see any actual OAuth logic. And that's because the authorization is kind of embedded um, right inside the App Engine environment for this API. And so it, it gives you what you really want, which is to be able to access, read, and write storage resources without having to think about authorization. Um, there are some scenarios where you really need to think it through, but in this particular case, if you're building an app that you want to just have it go directly to cloud storage, you don't even need to think about it, which is great. It just makes life easier. There's a more extensive example pointed to there if you want to dig in and see how to do that. Um, Detour. So 
the next slide has, is all about cross-origin resource sharing, which has a cute little demo. And in order to motivate that, I have a slide on uh, XHR. But I don't think I'm going to have time to go through it, so I'm going to kind of skip it. Um, but XHR is really the, I'll just mention what it is. XHR is the underlying mechanism by which websites, uh, web clients, um, access server resources asynchronously in the background. And so anytime you have a website like Gmail that's talking to the server and getting information for you without actually redrawing the page, it's using this technique. It's sometimes also called Ajax. And it's a super powerful technique. But the problem is that sometimes when you access those resources, if they happen to be cross-domain, meaning served by a different domain than the server where you got the original resource, you'll run into some constraints where it won't work. And we've added some a capability to Google Cloud Storage to make these cross-domain uh, accesses work well. So that's about all I can say within the allotted time. I don't even know if I have, probably don't have time for the demo. Um, there's a slide on pricing. Actually, if, I don't know, can we go over for anybody that's interested in seeing the demo, Amy? Or does this thing like turn off, like a pump, turn into a pumpkin? Um, no, it should be fine to, to go over. So obviously, you know, anyone who, who needs to leave, um, thank okay. you for joining us. And yeah, we'll just keep going until you finish. Okay. As long as people want more pain, I'll keep going. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the demo for now and come back to it for, for the people that really want to see it. Um, but I'm just going to jump through the rest of these um, at a high level. Here's a pricing chart. So if you're interested in how much is this all going to cost me, it's right here. But there's a link here. Again, the blue is going to take you to the pricing and support page. You can find out more. Um, and really the punchline of the whole talk and the kind of the thing I wanted to emphasize for everybody is um, if you need to store data, if you have a large um, need to deposit data in the cloud, um, think about the fact that Google does that with many petabytes of data every day on a planet-wide scale, and we do so with sub-second response time for hundreds of millions of users all the time. So instead of re reinventing that wheel and trying to build your own storage infrastructure, think about just taking advantage of what we've done, been doing for a long time. And then you can focus on your customers and what you do best. So that's it for the slides. I'll go back to the demo. Let me take a, a real quick real-time break to see if anybody has a question. I'll go back to the demos now. So um, I'll start with the XHR, because that's kind of motivating the whole thing. This is illustrating. I talked about what AJAX was. And I don't know how many people have I've written this kind of code or done this kind of thing before. But this slide is illustrating a typical AJAX interaction. So what it does is this is JavaScript code that would get downloaded to your browser. And it's defining a function called test get. And what test get does is it defines another function internally called callback. So this is very characteristic of JavaScript, defining a function inside another function. But the thing to know is that the callback function is really just something that will get called later when a certain request is completed. So the, the stuff I've highlighted in blue is just um, kind of, kind of um, something I'm creating, which I'm going to immediately stash off to the side for later. So what it is is that it's a function that's going to feel the response. And then there, it's going to say, when it actually gets invoked, it's going to look at the response. It's going to say, is this ready state 4 and status 200? That means the response to my request was successful. So it's going to pop up this alert and uh, show me the response text. So this entire block is waiting just to respond later on to my request. And then the rest of this function is formulating the request. So I create this magic XML HTTP request object. And I assign it a URL, or I, I, yeah, I'm going to feed it in a minute a URL. Now, this URL is a bucket and object in which I've stored some text. And then I set on ready state change equal to callback. So this is the magic plumbing. This is where I actually say, OK, this new object I just created, XML HTTP, I'm going to call it in a second. And when it gets to the ready state, I want, I want the 
JavaScript environment to invoke this function called callback, which I defined up here. And then I set, okay, the method, the HTTP method is get. The URL is that bucket and object that I defined up here. And true is whether I want it to be synchronous or asynchronous. And then I call send, and that's kind of the magic go button, which causes the request to get fired off. And then the callback function will eventually get, get hit with the right um, state in order to bring this alert up. If, for those of you who haven't written JavaScript, alert is a function that pops up this little um, interactive window that basically uh, presents some text and then gives you a little OK button to, to move on. So that's all the code for this example, um, except for this one line. This is creating a, an, this is HTML. It's creating a hyperlink, or yeah, it's creating a hyperlink where I've specifically overridden the on-click event. So when I click on the, the hyperlink defined by this text, um, it'll call the function I just defined, the test get function. And then down here where it says get content using, that's nothing more than an actual embedded copy of this HTML. So everything you see on this line is actually inside this link. In fact, um, it's exactly the same text. So if I click on it, it went and hit the server, fetched the contents of that MarkPres GDL 0502.12 test.txt, grab the contents of that, which is, as you can see, this is a test, and hit the alert, hit, hit my callback function, and that called the alert method, which um, presented the, the response data. Now, I can uh, also change that text. So here's a quick illustration of GSUtil. I can say GSUtil cat. Um, I'm going to snark the the uh, bucket and object path from this window, so I don't have to type all that. So, hopefully this will come back soon. Um, this should give me the, the contents of markprez slash gdl 50212 test.txt. Being temperamental now. There it is. Okay. I'm not sure why that was as slow as it was, but um, I'm going to change the contents now. So I'm going to say echo, here's a different test. And I'm going to pipe that into, instead of cat, I'm going to use copy, which copies from A to B. Normally you'll copy from, you know, a file to a cloud storage object or from one cloud storage object to another. Um, but because I'm sort of streaming the input from this echo command, I'm going to replace the input specification with the dash, which says basically take it from standard to input. So uh, access deny doesn't want me to be able to write it from this account. Uh, that's probably going to... So I guess this is a reason, an excuse to show you get apple. <laughs> I can say uh, get Apple, which will give me the access control list associated with that object. So let's get rid of the preamble here. Get Apple. Yep. Um, Mark, um, I'm not sure if people are able to see that window well. I can actually see it, but you might try making the font, the window in the okay. font, just a little bigger. So. The, the point of this, I'm, I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole because um, it's, I, I don't think I have the right permissions on this object. And oh, and uh, while I've interrupted you, we, we also have a question from the chat that you, you might want to okay. address. We'll be, um, from Patrick, will we be able to use the um, command line interface the same way we can use um, remote API, API shell um, for App Engine in terms of leaks and iteration? So, Basically, uh, GSUtil is a complete shell environment command capability, just like the, um, uh, the, the tool you referred to. But um, tell me more about what you had in mind specifically for, for um, loops and iteration. Is Patrick still on? Patrick's typing. 
I wanted to perform an op on multiple files. So yeah, there's all kinds of um, aggregation capabilities built into GSUtil as well as aggregation that you can use from the, the power of the Unix shell environment or the Linux shell environment. So for example, if you wanted to, um, let me share my screen again. Is everybody seeing my window? Um, so, you know, if you had 10 files or something, you can do things like for i in star do gsutil copy dollar i to wherever. Um, so the full power of the Unix shell is available to you here. But there's a whole bunch of aggregation capabilities built into gsutil as well. For example, if I wanted to, um, let's see. So I just created a small file tree A with a subdirectory B, which has a subdirectory C, or sorry, which has a file C. And I wanted to make a D as well. So if I wanted to upload that entire tree, let's make a bucket for it. I'll say MB for make bucket, GS colon, mark slash, uh, demo one. So that just created a bucket for me called mark demo one. If I say ls on that bucket, I see that there's nothing in it. Now, if I want to um, copy a file there, I can use the copy command a slash b slash c to gs mark demo one, and the ls will now show me that file, but I can also uh, transfer a whole tree worth of files. So I can say minus R A and sorry, copy minus R A and that copies um, all of the contents. So now if I go back to that ls command, um, I can say ls slash star star, which is the wild card for everything in that bucket. And there you see I have not only the C that I copied, but also the ABC and ABD, the entire file tree. If I wanted to copy th those files in parallel, I can say minus M, and that says transfer that whole file tree in parallel. It goes much faster. Not sure what that was. Um, anyway, that's really handy for a uh, large bulk bulk transfers. So that's all about the, uh, the XHR. Um, the demo that I wanted to show you, you can try as well. Um, let me just see, are there any questions before I skip to the next one? Okay. So um, you can click on this picture of a pool table and it'll show you the demo. And What's happening in this demo, so I mentioned all about Ajax and how, you know, when you try to access cross-domain resources, bad things happen. And that's actually what's happened here. So you see all the, the lack of color in this pool table. The, the pool balls are all black, basically. It doesn't look very good. And if I open up my um, developer, my Chrome uh, developer tool session, you can see that, um, Bad things have happened. <laughs> so it's taking a second, but um, if you look at the console, you see all these red messages about um, couldn't load this, couldn't load that, and specifically it's saying it's not allowed by access control allow origin. So what happened was I wrote a little app engine demo. That's this cores demo.appspot.com, and it loaded that demo, and then the JavaScript component in that demo went and fetched two types of objects, the texture for the pool balls, so that's the coloring on the outside of the pool balls, and the uh, audio for the sound in the pool game. And it couldn't access any of those resources because of cross-domain access problems. And so um, not only did I get those internal errors and did I get the weird coloration, but the app, the app just doesn't work at all. I'm getting weird stuff there. I can refresh it. and. 
It might limp along, like if I press space, I can actually approach the ball and try to take a shot, but it doesn't work very well. I pull back the cue and try to hit it, and it just hangs, it freezes. So all kinds of bad things are happening, basically. So now what I'll do is I'll open this window. Get that one out of the way, because it seems to be having a problem. Um, and I'll say cores. Uh, it just dawned on me what's going on here. Okay, I'm going to say cores texture on. And you can see it's running a gsutil command to set the cores settings. That, that's nothing more than certain a special configuration. You might make your font. Sorry? Sorry. You might make your font a little bit bigger. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So what that command is doing is it's setting the cores configuration on that bucket so that it's explicitly allowing a, a cross-domain fetch. So those XHR requests for the texture on the pool balls should succeed with that change. And as you see, as you can see, it did. It's a lot better now. It now actually looks like a pool game. But I only got the texture. I didn't get the audio. So if I do the same thing where I shoot the pool ball, it hangs again, and if I open up the window, I'm not going to go through the details, but if I, I open up the developer tool window, you'll see again, I got, uh, actually, I, maybe I will quickly. You'll see that I got successful um, access to the texture files, but my access to the audio files failed. And for some reason, this is a little sluggish. I think it's because I'm streaming here. But you can see I'm still getting, I'm not sure it's easy to tell, but the, uh, yeah, you see all these are now WAV files. So it's getting access to the texture stuff, but it can't get to the WAV files. So now what I'll do is go back to my command window, and I'll set the text or the uh, cores on for audio. So cores audio on. And really all this is doing is another gsutil command. I just put it in a convenient script for, for simplicity. It's doing gsutil set cores. On.xml is the cores, is the syntax for turning on the cores capability on this particular bucket, mark cores audio. That's where I'm actually fetching those WAV files. So with that done, I should get the whole nine yards. I should get both the texture files and the audio files. And if I turn on the sound, this will make a nicer presentation. So there's my text files, and the audio should be working. And by the way, this is a nice demo because it's showing off um, some HTML, native HTML5 capabilities. So this is all done with WebGL and uh, Web Audio. So um, there's no flash or any other third party going on here. And um, the, the graphics is quite nice. Like as you can see, I have full 3D um, motion of the pool table. And uh, I can uh, zoom in and out and so on. But anyway, if I hit the space bar, and you can try this demo yourself as well now. If I hit the space bar, it takes me right to the pool table. And now, finally, if I pull back on the cue stick and let go, that was like the lamest break I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> I'm not sure why it's so sluggish. Let's try one more time. I have a feeling my poor little laptop is, is uh, working its little brains out. But let's try one more time. All right, so pull back on the queue. Yeah, I think it's it's a little overworked at the moment, but let's let it rip. Yeah, so as you can see, I'm getting both the graphics and the audio now, and I'm accessing it on a on a uh, cross-domain basis. Everything is working nicely with the with the reconfigured buckets. I'll try one more shot so I can get. Maybe I can get this ball in.
Maybe not. <laughs> My laptop's a little overworked right now, so I don't think it's going to work much much better than this. But uh, that's about it. Any other any questions? Uh, uh Mark. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just um, the uh, the demos. I, I missed the beginning piece where you're talking about where the uh, all these files were, the, the presentation and the demos. Is that in that the link? This um, the uh, that short link that you that's at the bottom of the presentation. Yeah. Let me, let me pull that up for you. Right at the bottom left here, google.go.gl slash Plexia is the best I can pronounce. Uh, C-L-X-E-A. Okay, and that's, the, and that's the only link. That's a, That link has everything on it. That link has all the slides you've seen uh, during this Hangout. Yep. Now, okay. What, what should also be the, the same link in the chat room? Okay. Yep. So I've gone over it by a good bit, and I apologize for that, but I'm really pleased that um, as many people wanted to stick around and see the demo. I hope you guys got something good out of this. And um, as I said a couple of times, my email address is on those slides. If you think of some, some questions or just something you want to talk about outside the scope of this Hangout, um, feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to talk to people about using cloud storage. So unless there are any last questions, I think I'm all done, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thanks very thank much. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. Okay, my best.